Hello and, and welcome everyone to this week's installment of the Wildlife Department's Next Generation Wildlife Eco Series. Uh, the, this series highlights the achievements and amplifies the voices of early career wildlife biologists. This next generation of scientists is more diverse than the community of natural resource scientists as a whole. Yet we recognize that systemic racism continues to impose barriers for black indigenous and people of color seeking careers in natural resources. This speaker series will not only spotlight professional achievements of black indigenous people of color scientists who are role models for this next generation. Uh, we hope it will also serve as a forum to discuss how our field can move forward to reduce barriers and become a more inclusive community. The Wildlife Department is committed to challenging the status quo in the discipline and to helping propel a more diverse next generation of wildlife biologists forward. And we hope that the series is a first step towards doing that. Uh, I will uh, pass the mic here to Dr. Matt Johnson, who will be introducing today's speaker. All right, thanks, Dan. Yeah, I have the great privilege of introducing Alejandra Martinez Salinas. Uh, whose work I've admired for several years. Um, she brings a fresh perspective to wildlife conservation, seeking to integrate the needs of people and biodiversity in working landscapes of Mesoamerica. Um, Alejandra is originally from Nicaragua and she holds a BS degree in ecology and development, um, a master's in management and conservation of tropical forests and biodiversity, and a PhD in natural resources. Um, and she's been living in Costa Rica off and on since 2006. Uh, most of Alejandra's work focuses on understanding the conservation value of agricultural land uses using bird communities as proxies of biodiversity. Ale is particularly interested in experimental methods that allow measurement and quantification of ecosystem services and in understanding the trade-offs between biodiversity, conservation, ecosystem service provisioning, and food production. So please join me in virtually welcoming Ale to HSU and to our Next Generation Eco Series. Thank you very much, Matt. So it's a pleasure to be here and thank you so much for inviting me. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and hopefully everything will work out from here. Okay, so sh you should be seeing my full screen so I get a thumbs up, so that means everything's okay. So I'm just going to go ahead. So thank you so much for having me. Um, like Matt says, a nice Spanish Matt. Usually Nicaragua is a tricky word. Um, I'm originally from Nicaragua, uh, but I've been living in Costa Rica for over 10 years now. And this presentation today um, originally was going to be a little bit broader, but I ended up focusing on the work that I've been doing with several colleagues in Costa Rica. And it's also, it's also going to be focused on, on bird conservation in agricultural lands. So I heard that most of you um, like birds and coffee, so I guess we're going to be safe in that, in that area. So, like I mentioned, um, and this is uh, this this presentation is going to be heavy with photos from many different moments. So, uh, I'm a, I'm originally an ecologist. Um, so, I've been working um, most of my career with bird conservation, with mist netting, with point counts. We're usually thinking about biodiversity conservation in in broader aspects, and and working actually with birds to try to tackle some of the issues with biodiversity conservation in tropical lands. I'm originally from Nicaragua, so I worked there a little bit, uh, and I've also been working for a while now in Costa Rica and have a couple other projects in, in Mexico. Um, one of the main things that um, kind of focus my attention is uh, the big challenges that we have right now. So you're, you're probably all familiar with the big challenges, particularly in tropical regions of the world. Um, we know that pretty much 38% of the Earth's ice-free land surface is dedicated to, to food production, and that means crops on pasture lands. Um, that requires like an understanding of what are the contributions of the different land uses to biodiversity conservation or bird conservation, uh, which is the, the one group that I focus on. And following this, th this idea, um, well, I've, I've been working for almost, I think, 
10 or 12 years in Costa Rica, particularly in this region that it's um, in, in a red circle, which is the Volcanica Central Talamanca Biological Corridor. Uh, biological corridors are a conservation strategy that the Costa Rica government has been pushing for the last couple of decades. And it's basically the idea that there should be a combination of people and wildlife and conservation living together in this, what we call working landscapes. But it's, it's not a traditional kind of biological quarter in a sense that it's primary forest and everything is protected. It means that people get to live in these areas and we get to work together to think about uh, better management of the land um, to work towards conservation. And one of the main goals is either increase or um, restore connectivity for biological um, organisms. So in this biological corridor, which is um, closely to 5 million hectares, um, the main land use is still forest, it's close to 50%. So this is so you get an idea of the kind of study site that I'll be talking about while I take you on this journey of uh, working with birds in the last couple of years. Um, but it's also one of the big things in this landscape besides forests, there's a, a good percentage of agriculture. So mainly pastures, uh, which we all know that depending on how we manage the land, this can be not so good for biodiversity. Um, we also have coffee, we have shrublands, and we also have sugarcane. So we have two major um, monocultures, sugarcane and pasture, and some coffee that is um, manage in, in different ways. So in this, um, in this study site, uh, we selected a couple of land uses and we focus on those land uses to evaluate the bird community. And we focus on these land uses because as I mentioned in the previous slide, those are the land uses present within this biological corridor. And we want to, to get an idea of the conservation value of these different land uses. If you move from A to H, uh, we're thinking about um, a gradient of, in, of land use intensity going from forest, from multistrata coffee, multistrata cacao, tea plantation, mixed species plantation, simple agroforestry coffee, life fences, and sugar cane. And for those of you that are not familiar with agroforestry systems, it's basically the combination of crops with trees. And this combination can be, it can also include animals, um, but it's a, a series of combinations of crop animals and um, trees uh, kind of covered. So basically what we're trying to look at here is how to make this otherwise uh, monoculture or simple crops um, be more uh, beneficial for wildlife or biodiversity in general by increasing the, the vertical structure of these habitats. And, during, during almost 10 years, we conducted mist netting in this, in this different land uses. So we, we went every morning and evaluate and catch the birds and band them and then go back and try to assess what was going on in terms of the community. And what we learned um, from the first uh, set of analysis that we've done with this data, and these are, these are simple um, accumulation curves what you're looking at. And we're just comparing the number of species that we've seen in each one of these land uses, depending on the effort that we have invested in, in visiting the sites. Um, to the naked eye, the first impression is that, well, there's not that much going on in the forest. Um, the second is that agroforestry systems such as coffee, cacao, and the life fences seem to be contributing a lot of, in, a lot of the species in this community. And that's why we also, um, and this is thinking about species richness as this is the, the amount of species that we um, have been getting in our mist nettings and in our mist nets um, with different efforts, with the different visits that we do to these sites. One of the things that um, I remember very, very well when I was um, a, lot a lot younger is that many times we, we, people used to say that forests were important because the amount of species presence in the forest. But this is not really the tendency that we're seeing here. So later in life, I understood that it's not about the number of species, but about the, the type of species. And this is the second part of this, um, of how we look at this data. 
here we, we, we can see, for example, if you focus on the first um, square on the upper left corner that says forest, if we go to 40 samples, we are getting pretty much close to 40 species. And when we compare that to the Latin fences at 40 samples, we're getting a little bit more than 60 species. But that doesn't really mean that the forest is less important. It just means that um, because of the method that we're using, which are misnettings, we're probably losing a lot of the information or the species that are moving in the middle or upper, upper elevations. So we need to be careful with, with that information. Also, uh, it's, always interest, it's always important to think about something else than just species richness. It's not just about how many species and how many individuals, which is abundance. It's also about the identity of this species. So who is present and who is absent. So we think about this um, as the community. What is the, what is the community composition of each one of these land uses? Because maybe the forest doesn't have that many bird species, but the species that are present may be not present in other land uses. So we go to um, the importance of thinking about um, who is in those land uses and what else can we say about that. This graph over here is just showing that comparison, thinking about the composition of this community. So each one of the, of the little um, clumps of information that you're looking corresponds to each one of, each one of the land uses we've been working in. So in the, in the left side of the graph, the one that says A, we're looking at uh, all the years from 2008 to 2014. And in the, on the right, the one that's uh, labeled B, we're looking only 2012 to 2014. And that is because in 2012, we included the, the plantations. So we wanted to include additional sites um, and we wanna see how they behave in, in these two different moments. Uh, on the left side, what we're looking for instance, and this is um, a, a multivariate analysis that allows us to compare the type of species that are present in those communities and how similar or different those communities are from one another. What we're seeing here is that the forest, which is on the left side on the graph, uh, it's different than the rest of the land uses. And also important is that the agroforestry systems, such as coffee and cacao, seems to be similar in terms of the composition of the species that we're looking in these systems. Forests and sugarcane are on the opposite ends of this graph meaning that the species that we're finding in this land uses are very different between them. And we find similar patterns when we do the analysis for the, and we include the teak and the, the teak plantation and the mixed species, and those actually fall nicely within the agroforestry system. So what we're saying is that all of these species are sharing uh, some of the species that we're seeing in this. So the community, uh, between them is very similar. Uh, so the importance in here is to remember what we look first about the richness and the abundance and how in terms of the community, the forest is actually very different than the rest of the other land uses. So its contribution is that it's um, conserving unique species in this landscape. Also, what we learned from here, and uh, as I was uh, talking to, to Matt before, that this presentation is going to have a lot of coffee in it, and uh, is that uh, what we're learning from, from agroforestry systems is that even though it seems that they make important contributions to biodiversity conservation, and in this case in particular, the bird conservation, it's all dependent on the management. That means that the, the three images that you're looking at, where on the left side, it's a diagram that shows the different type of vertical structure that a coffee system may have uh, from simple monoculture, uh, sun, um, um, open and, and completely uh, without trees to very, very complex uh, vertical structure, which is uh, the diagram with the letter A that resembles more like a, like a forest. So it's pretty much a forest in which people started to plant coffee plants on, on the understory. So it's very um, uh, complex in a vertical structure. And then you have two photos, and those are actually two coffee plantations, but they look very, very different. And in terms 
terms of the contributions to bird conservation, um, they are very different also. Uh, on, on the middle, the one that says our forestry coffee system, it, well, we have a nice uh, different types of trees and different types of heights, which actually provides different kind of habitats to the different species that are uh, potentially using these land uses. And on the right side, we're looking um, sun coffee, which is basically a monoculture without trees. So it's conservation value. It's, it's, not exactly, it's not exactly the same. So not all agroforestry systems should be looked at the same way. And it's, we, all, we always need to think about the contributions from the structure and the types of um, variables that are contributing these systems for bird, bird habitat. And this, um, this next study case, which is also in the same area actually, uh, focused on the coffee bird water, which I know Matt has been done a lot of work on. And actually, I don't know if he remembers this, but when I was starting, um, when I was starting my work uh, as a PhD student, I actually sent him an email. And one of the things that I remember vividly is how nice he was at providing me feedback about my research ideas. So, um, and he was, he was already, he, he had already published some information about his work in Jamaica with coffee and the coffee bird water, which actually inspires some of this, this work that I'm going to be presenting. And this is something that I did for, for my, for my PhD program. Um, so I, I took what I've learned from the different land uses and I decided to focus on coffee systems and also trying to understand, okay, how do we improve bird conservation in coffee systems? How do we convince farmers our birds are important? Be, besides the fact that they're pretty and that we usually like to see them and we like, we enjoy hearing them, to hear them, but it usually takes some, some more, something more. It usually takes some more information. So there was a, um, a trend of, of different researchers working with uh, pest control and the contribution of bird species to pest control. In this case, the, the coffee bird water, which is one of the, the pests that affects coffee production and one of the, one of the most damaging ones um, across the world. The coffee bird water, it's this tiny beetle that you're looking at in this slide. It's, it can be about two millimeter in size, so it's very, very small. And there's a very small window in time in which farmers can actually prevent this beetle to drill a hole in the coffee berry and eat the seed. And what's really important in coffee production is to actually have the seeds to sell. So it's a, it's a big thing. And one of the, the, the big questions is, are our birds really contributing to controlling the coffee berry water or not? And so that was the question, the question for this particular study. I focus on, on, on coffee systems within the biological, the Volcanica Central Talamanca Biological Corridor, and ask whether these the coffee with the, the birds in these systems, particularly insectivorous birds, were actually contributing to the control of the coffee bird water. Um, we set up this experiment. Uh, in which we selected uh, several sites, at least 10 sites, and we selected different plants of coffee and constructed what is called exclosure experiment. So we keep the birds out. So we, we think, uh, or we have, or hypothesis is that bird, if birds are really important for the control of the coffee berry water, in those plants where the where the birds are not allowed to forage, the infestation is going to be higher if they're actually doing their job of eating the coffee berry water and controlling this pest, which I mentioned, it's it's really bad for for coffee growers. And we did other several things. Like we captured a couple. Um, we did um, mist netting. Um, exercises in each one of the plots that we worked and we captured individuals and we collected also feces samples to run DNA analysis and try to see if we actually detected the DNA of the coffee bird water. So we have direct evidence of these birds actually eating the, the beetle. And this we, all, all of this we did in, in 2015, so not so long ago. 
We actually, we, we, we also use um, the functional diversity approach, which is um, key to understanding how species interactions translate into ecosystem functioning and service provision. And the FD or the functional diversity of a community when we measure it, allow us to, stu to study the value, the range, the distribution and the abundance of the traits or those characteristics that are present in species that we are interested that we are interested on. In our case, for instance, um, we focus on collecting functional traits where are any measurable characteristics of any given individual, and this can be morphological, physiological, phenological, or behavioral. And when information from specimens from museums and a combination of data that we've been collecting over the years doing misnetting, we focus on traits that are important for insectivory because those birds um, that are eating the coffee berry water are eating insects. Uh, some of those traits, for instance, where the overall body mass of the of the birds that we identify within this within the plots that we were working on, the preferred foraging location, the preferred habitat type, the preferred food type, the different different measurements of the beak because that's how they catch these insects and they, how they forage and move around on the plants trying to get um, food. And um, so the bill length, bill length, bill length from tip to navis, bill height, bill width, the tarsus length, and body length. And we use and we use all of this information to construct um, functional diversity indices. And then we move to uh, assess what what's going on in each one of our plots, and we identify over 2,000 bird species, so that's the abundance, and we recorded over 90 bird species that were distributed in 35 families. Most of the species that we found in our plots were um, insectivores, which is really good because we were trying to assess the community in terms of the pest control service that they can provide. Uh, but there was also a combination of of different um, species, um, whether only or exclusively insectivore, or whether insectivores were also consuming other types of, of, of food, like fruit seeds and nectar. And, and some of them did not include invertebrates, but only that was only a 14% of all the species that we were able to detect in this, uh, in this, in this 10 uh, plots that we were working on. Also, some of the results in terms of these experiments of excluding the birds and seeing if they were effective or important in the predation of the coffee bird water is that we found that the numbers of the coffee bird water, which the Latin name is Hippotheneus hampe, will vary temporally with highest concentrations between February and April and November and December. And this is interesting not just because it also overlaps with the migration system or neotropical migrants, so we potentially have um, neotropical migratory species that are also consuming the coffee bear water, but it's also important to know where is the peaks of the infestation so farmers can decide what would be the best way to manage the infestation or to manage this condition in their plots. In terms of what we found in the infestation in the, in the, in the coffee shops that were excluded from the bird activity, we did find that the infestation rates were statistically significantly higher than those in comparing to those coffee shrubs that were exposed to the bird activity. So remember at the beginning we thought that, okay, so if birds are really important to uh, control the coffee bird water, if they're actually eating the coffee bird water, we would expect that if we don't allow birds to forage in certain plants, the infestation will be higher. And nicely, that's exactly what we found. We also found uh, that this infestation varied and that variation, it's, it's, very, um, it's very broad uh, from 5.5 to almost 78%. So imagine a farmer that is trying to make a living out of a coffee plantation that it's getting an infestation of over 70% in, in its fruits. So that's a big problem because the coffee bear water, what it does, it's actually eating the seed 
and it's the, the one thing that has the economic um, importance. We also found some variation in the, in the shrubs that were not excluded from the bird activity, and that variation went from 6.2 to 27.8 percentage of infestation. So with all of this information, um, we learn, and not only from this study, because one of the things that it's interesting about building on what other researchers have found is that we get to also have additional questions about, okay, so we now know that these type of land uses like coffee system partic systems, particularly those that are managed as agroforestry or complex vertical structure are important for bird conservation, but also birds may actually be helping farmers in these plots by controlling the coffee bird water. So it's a two-way street. You have a better habitat for birds and you increase the, the richness and the abundance of the insectivores and they're also helping you by controlling a pest that it's actually um, potentially have a very negative economic impact into your, into your productivity, which at the end it's money and it's livelihoods for the coffee farmers in these regions. So it's a very interesting connection. After we were, um, we conducted this, we also check about the, the importance and uh, statistically significance of all the many variables that we use um, using the a response variable that is related to the difference of the board berries from the exclosure and non-exclosure experiment. And the important thing here that I'm going to highlight so you don't get DC with all these numbers, is that all of the functional diversity indices that we calculated were significant predictors of the, of the differences in infestation rates of the coffee bird water. And one of the things in ecology right now that um, many of us are, 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 are questioning or wanting to learn a little bit more is what it's the relationships between only looking at species richness and also considering other things such as functional diversity indices and measuring traits and all this because it, it might be and and um, and this is in quotes but I'm, it might be easy to measure that in trees because they don't move uh, but when we're working with wildlife going into the traits it might be more difficult because you need to get enough measurements to have enough variability to actually have um, um, a good, um, a good um, prediction of what the trait uh, look like within that community or within that population. We also found that um, the total species richness and particularly the presence of gleaner uh, species that are the ones that actually walk on top, on top of the branches of coffee looking, actively looking for insects, were also significant predictors of, of the differences in infestation rates. And from the, the collections that we did with um, feces, uh, we also encountered that a positive uh, DNA identification of the coffee bird water. So when you think about this experiment, you might think, okay, so, but maybe our, the birds are not the ones eating the coffee bird water. They might be spiders or there might be ants eating these insects. How do you actually know that the birds are the ones responsible? And these provide us with um, um, more direct evidence as well that the, these uh, birds are eating um, these pests, and that they are actually contributing to the to the to the pest control of the coffee bear water. And this species, it's a it's a mixture between uh, residents and migrants. And this mixture, it's very in interesting because it, it talks about functional redundancy, which is basically thinking about how these species have traits or shared traits that uh, can help in the in the control of the coffee berry water um, but the, th the fact that maybe someday we lose one species or two doesn't mean that we're going to lose the service because we have many different species that are actually uh, providing the same service and this is just one study um, there are other list of species from a work conducted by um, Matt and colleagues and other people also in in Africa and 
and also in Costa Rica that have found that even more species of the ones that I'm showing here are actually consuming the coffee, the coffee berry water. So that's really important to inform the need to have a, a working, to work together with farmers and explain to them that it's not just about conservation, it's also about receiving something from conserving wildlife that, that will actually benefit uh, benefit their, their production and their, their ability to make a living. So something else that we, we came up after this is that, so we have the two pieces of the puzzle. We know that coffee is important. We know that birds are important. But then how, how do we keep moving to, to ask other questions? And like I said, um, this is a, a photo where you're looking at of a, of a huge coffee farm and it's pretty much some coffee. So what a, what a big difference would make, for instance, if we have all of this area with um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of trees and, and that would make a huge impact in terms of the habitat that we're providing for wildlife, but also in terms of connectivity, both structural and, and, and functional. And we also uh, start thinking about the importance of knowing, for instance, how the provision of these services change um, when considering other things that are happening at the plot level. Because when we, when we do these kind of experiments or when we think about these questions, we're much of the time thinking about one specific thing, but there's so much going on in the plot that we are not considering, so many interactions that we're not really considering it, that we started thinking, okay, what else can we do? So in that line, we started thinking, okay, so the, the things that we've learned and the things that other people have learned by doing research and experiments in many different places, um, things, um, points into the direction that farm management is extremely important and that it's embedded in a context in which we need to consider the landscape patterns, we need to consider the climate and how that affects, for instance, if we want to focus on birds and pest control and bees and pollination services and how that affects coffee production and then how that information can go back as outreach and engagement to try to change some of the ways that we are managing farms. So informing farmers about the benefits of having these communities in their, in their farms or in the lands and how, how important that is for them. So we started thinking about these ideas and, and we started designing a new experiment that we're actually just finishing right now. We're starting to analyze the data and we're finding really interesting um, information. We started thinking about, okay, so what about if we combine many different things? We, we, we can combine types of shades. So we know there's some coffee, there's something intermediate and they can be diverse shades. And we also know that depending on the farmer's condition, he can have two different kind of management intensities. Ones that have a very high management intensity, meaning that they frequently apply fertilizers, they apply insecticides, they apply many different things because they have the economic means to do it. And others that basically because of the low prices of coffee, it's pretty much whatever comes out of my parcel, I'm good with, but I'm not putting anything back in because the, either, either way, I'm not making a whole lot of money because the prices are too low right now. And then we have the, the idea of the altitudinal gradient and how we can explore um, climate impacts into, into these two services that are really important for coffee productivity. And we started working with that idea and we started also engaging with farmers, which are the, the photos that you see on the left. We actually went out into the field and started talking with farmers. Um, and this is the map again of the Volcanica Central Talamanca Biological Corridor. And the little black triangles indicate the farms that are working on right now, which are 30 farms that are distributed across the area of the, of the corridor. Um, and, and one of the first things that we started to do is um, engaging with the farmers, try, go out, talk to them, ask them about their, how they manage their, their farms, asking them, what do they know about birds? Do they, do they know anything about birds and 
and coffee berry water? Do they know that the birds help them somehow? And the majority of them, as expected, does, don't know. Uh, like they know the birds are, re are there and, um, and they like them. But besides that, they, they pretty much are not aware that there's this two-way street in which if they improve the habitat for bird conservation, they also get in something return. So we started by having these conversations and also asking about bees. Why do they know about bees? Do they know whether bees are important for their, for their coffee plants or not? Do they see them in their plots? Do they do anything in their management that actually it's helping or, or, or damaging these communities? And having these conversations allow us to get an idea and to actually have a first impression of uh, what the farms look like in terms of the structure and whether we could initially put them in separate beans, considering, okay, so this one is a sun coffee farm, this is a low diversity shade farm, and this is a complex diversity shade farm. And we started working for, from there. And we also created a new experiment. So we're, we're back in the field and we're thinking, okay, so we're gonna do uh, more, ex uh, more exposure experiments, but this time we're gonna do them in a way that allow us to assess um, two ecosystem services, the, the pest control that it's provided by, by birds and, um, and the pollination service that it's provided by bees. And we selected eight plants in each one of these, in each one of these farms. So there's 30 farms and we selected eight plants in four plants, uh, randomly, we decided that those four are going to be um, excluded from the bird activity. So we're going to put this big mesh on top of these four um, plants, pretty much like a, like a small house with, with a mesh. Uh, so we don't allow birds to go in or out, um, but we do allow water, wind, insects, and everything else to move. And then in each one of the plants, we also selected branches that we were going to exclude for the bee activity. So at the end, we're gonna have like a cross experiment in which we're gonna have um, some plants in which both birds and bees are gonna be present or, or some branch, may, I, I correct, some branch in, in which bees and birds are gonna be present and gonna have influence, then some branch in which none are gonna be able to, to deliver the service, whether it's pollination or pest control, because the, the branches are gonna be covered by mesh for the bees and that plant's gonna be covered by that mesh to keep the birds out. And then all the other branches in which only bees are gonna have access, birds are excluded, and then others in which only birds are gonna have access, bees are excluded. So this sounds all confusing and <laughs> I actually have a photo for you to see what I'm trying to explain um, in words. Uh, so we have different plants. Uh, four plants are gonna be covered by a mesh. So we exclude birds from those plants, but we'll also have individual branches in which we're gonna be excluding the bees. And we've, and we've done this um, throughout 2019, and we um, just finished uh, in April or May this year, I think, if I recall correctly. This, this year seems longer than other years. Um, but around that, that date, uh, we, we collected all the information that we needed and we started analyzing the information. And what we're getting for that is that, for instance, if we consider our treatments, how they're cross. When we're looking at considering the late fruit set response, which is basically how many fruits were produced from the initial flowers that each branch had when we count them. What we're seeing is that the most important thing is when we exclude the bees. So in the y-axis, you're looking at the response variable, the mean late fruit set, and the x and the x axis you're looking whether when the bees are absent they're excluded so it's no bees and where the bees are present uh, so those are not excluded what we're looking in this graph is that when the bees are not present the mean late fruit set is lower and when the bees are present the, the mean late fruit set is higher but what is even more interesting is that when the bees are present but also the birds are present that mean late fruit said it's also even better. So we're looking at here that even if the presence of both organisms is actually contributing 
to the to the to the creation or, or of fruits and this might be the effect of the birds also helping in pollination so this is really important in terms of why can, why is it important to conserve bees and birds in, in coffee systems because that means more fruits and more fruits means more money and more money means a better way of uh, making a living. So we're trying to come up with ideas of expressing this to farmers in a way that, I, that they can understand why this is important and why conservation matters and uh, that is actually linked to their livelihoods. Something else that we found, and this is a, a, a principal component analysis of using the information that we collected about vegetation that the information that we collected within our plots um, help us to separate the farms that we're working on. So we have uh, full sum farms, we have simplified farms with simplified shade, and we have farms with diversified shade. And why we did that? Well, we want to know, for instance, if shade is actually doing something for the, for the delivery of the ecosystem services such as pollination and pest control. And then we relate that information with, um, with the same response variable what we looked before. So in the y-axis, you're going to have the mean value of the lay fruit set. In the x-axis, we're going to have the one of the axes of the principal component analysis in the previous slide as the vegetation complexity. And we can see how the treatments change when we move in from um, not diversified shade to very diversified shade on the y on the on the x on the x axis the most important message i think from this from this um, slide is that when we have both so when we when we don't exclude birds and bees which is the natural conditions of the farms it seems that the lay fruit set improves a little bit, but it's not significant with the, with the increasing of the vegetation complexity. What is even more important is what happens when we exclude, when we exclude both organisms, which is the, the green line. When we exclude both and we go from simple to complex in vegetation, there's a big gain in the amount of, or the mean lay fruit set. So we get more fruits. A lot of the, the mechanisms behind what the vegetation is actually contributing, um, we're still not sure about, but it's interesting to see that there is a direct uh, relationship between what we're seeing in the mean life fruit set and the increasing of the vegetation that we could argue that having uh, systems that are more complex in the vegetation or the shade might actually be good to stabilize or stabilize the, the service of these two communities. And it makes sense in terms of the, the type of habitat that they're providing and the diverse type of habitat that they're providing. So at the end of, of all this, uh, we're, we're thinking that, for instance, the coffee production and the coffee farmers um, gets, get benefits from biodiversity that are, that are from biodiversity mediated ecosystem services. So it's important to conserve biodiversity, not just because we like the birds or we like the bees, but because we actually getting benefits from doing it. And that the management decisions impact biodiversity conservation value of ecosystems systems as well as productivity and understanding these relationships will benefit farmers and biodiversity conservation because like I said before it's it's kind of like looking at it as a two-way street. Something else that we've, we've been doing is trying to get this message in a way that everybody can understand why it is important. So outreach, we think that, that many times we don't do enough translating a lot of all these graphs and number and p-values to actually get to the people and let them know why this is important. So we're engaging and investing a lot of time and, and, and energy into creating environmental educational products that we will deliver to farmers. And we're, we're working with also associates uh, across Central America, all the countries in Central America, to actually get to the coffee associations and get this information across that we need to think about better ways of manage, managing the coffee farms so we can benefit biodiversity, but we can also get benefits in return that it's pest control and pollination. And by saying that, it's also 
um, thinking about educational activities in general, working with many people, I've been in, in many ways um, um, very, very fortunate to, to work with many different people and to have the space to, to create together. And also, uh, I think we have a, a, a great responsibility to translate this information to even the next generations that are, that are coming um, after us. Um, so thank you to all the people that have collaborated over time with all the, all the, the data that I have presented, which is not just me, there's a whole bunch of people. And that's the other aspect also of science and doing research is the, the amount of collaborations that you get to do and, and how you can learn from many different people in the field, from people that have done similar studies that can help you um, create new questions just because somebody else already found out uh, basic information or set up the, the base for you to, to have more creativity into asking questions. And with that, so I want to thank you all for your attention and hopefully that was um, a little bit interesting and not didn't take that much of your time. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandra. Sure, no problem. Right, getting lots of uh, lots of virtual applause, lots of Zoom applause. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new world. That's right. Um, okay, so we've got some time for questions, um, and we can do those either by just um, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and, and ask a question, um, or you can type things in the chat, and and I will relay those um, to Alejandra. And we do already have one in the chat, and that is from Jim Moore, and he asked, "Are bees?" mostly honeybees, or are you also monitoring other and maybe especially native bee species? Awesome question and thank you so much. And no, the answer is no. We're actually trying to focus on native bees. And um, I had a, a slide somewhere that I can dig in a couple minutes to show you. We, what we Actually, one of the, the great things that we're doing with this new work is that we're collaborating with Taylor Ricketts from the University of Vermont in the Gunn Institute. So he's a pollination expert and he's done a lot of work in pollination and coffee in, in Costa Rica and, and in other places. Uh, so he's part of the project. He's our senior advisor in our project. So we're actually focused on native bees. And we're really happy that we're not just seeing Apis mellifera, which is the honeybee. And one of the interesting things that we're just, um, that are just emerging from the community information that we have is that Apis seems to be the one dominant in sun coffee systems. But when you move towards more, more complex habitats or places where there's more forest around, more trees around, you get a, a lot of diversity of, of bees. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, there's another, uh, actually a couple questions from Brian Fagundes. Um, first question is, does the magnitude of difference between the bees, no bees um, in the late fruit set result in significant increased crop yield? So not just fruit set, but does that translate into crop yield? Good question. Yes, we're looking into the yield information actually right now. And this is the paper that we're working on and we're seeing that tendency, it increases yield. It is, uh, it is very positive and we're very excited because it's not only about the bees, it's also the additive effect of having the birds also. So when you think about this, we usually think about the importance of bees in pollination, but we don't think how they interact with other organisms. What we're seeing here is, is that bees are ex very important, but they are very, very important. But when you add birds on top of that, it's actually a little bit more important as well. And yes, there is an effect on productivity. Cool. Uh, and the second question that Brian had was, um, with your background as an ecologist, what tools and organizations helped with the collaborative efforts to broaden out to cultural and socioeconomic research as well? Yeah, good question. So one of the things that, um, that I think that has helped me a lot is that I've been very fortunate in a lot of ways. Uh, being from Nicaragua, for instance, like um, I, I guess you can say um, I'm from a medium class family. Um, so my father is a doctor. My father is actually a surgeon. And one of the things that he was very keen at 
when I was a child is that uh, you need to learn English. So that's not a problem for you guys. So you're already ahead. <laughs> so from being from a non-English speaking country, it's like what's the one thing that can give you an open doors, give you more opportunities, uh, being bilingual, try to have some tools like Okay, so you're, you're, you're already learning another language, but what about your computer skills, which now seems to be something that it's everybody knows so much about computers. That was not the case 20 years ago, believe me, or 30 years ago. So all that helped me a lot. And actually the first opportunity that I, that I had when I was in the university, I study ecology and development in Nicaragua in um, the Central American University, and that's a Jesuit University. Uh, so they have a big focus on, on learning and being critical and analytical. They're not just about, um, you know, the usual things of, on, on the religion aspect. Um, so one of the things that helped a lot is that uh, I got in contact because I was um, working as an assistant student for a teacher back in Okay, do I remember this? I think it was back in 1997. And um, that was actually my first interaction with Berg researchers was with, an SMIT, with some colleagues from the Smithsonian Berg Center, um, the late Ross Greenberg and Peter Bichir and Peter Mara. So I started with the right foot because I knew English. So I got contact to be an assistant. I was a field assistant to go work in the Pine Oak um, Eco region when they were doing their their very well known work now about the importance of a uh, coffee and bird conservation and they were looking at other at other ecosystems. Something else that helped me a lot was also I was involved in associations and organizations in my country. So there was a couple opportunities that were actually sponsored by different organizations in the United States, like Partners in Flight, like um, the U.S. Forest Service. I actually did a couple internship, one in the North Cascades National Park and one in Oregon. Um, I did some misnet in there. I, I learned a lot about the different culture that was not exactly Nicaragua. <laughs> so at that time, and I was living in my country. So that was very important into like opening my eyes to see other stuff and, and improving my English, which helped a lot and has also, again, opened many doors. And after that, I think one main thing um, in terms of, um, and I know this series has a big focus on how do we open doors for other people? I think it helps a lot that, um, if you found the, the, the people, like I feel in this case, it's, it's creating this community that there's support around people that wants to do research or wants to do into a science career. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, make sure that you ask for help. Maybe make sure that you reach out to people. Um, I was telling in, in one of the slides um, that I don't know if Matt remembers it, but I actually sent him an email back in 2014, so six years ago. I was reading his papers and it was, a, you know, author contact information. And you get kind of hesitant. Should I send him an email? Is he going to be nice? He's going to say like, oh no, somebody else got an email asking these things. But actually, got the courage to send the email and get like this very lengthy, lengthy response <laughs> with um, many advices and stuff that I really appreciate it. So I think one of the, the things that we need to learn is that we, we can reach out to people and mo most people are nice out there in science. So, and if you get not such a nice one, just try the next one. All right, great. Yeah, thank you. Some great lessons there. I mean, you know, thinking about the assets that each person brings um, to the table, whether it's being bilingual, you know, some of you here in the audience speak Spanish or French or Swahili. Um, those are assets that you can bring to your career and looking for this, um, looking, asking for help and seeking those extracurricular experiential opportunities. So yeah, thank you. Um, another question from the audience from Nate Davidson said, what made you want to get into this field of work? <laughs> really interesting, um, Nate. I think I always liked, uh, it's just kind of like the cliche, I always liked animals. So I knew I was gonna go into the field somehow. 
I actually started with marine biology because I thought I wanted to work in the water with um, marine wildlife. And then somehow that changed along the line. So other lesson is, is do not be afraid to change lanes. Uh, if, you, if you found something else that you love and you decide to switch, it's okay. Uh, I think one of the main things in, in doing what we do is that you gotta, you gotta love what you do. And, and that sounds cheesy, I know, but if you don't like it, it's gonna be, it's not gonna be nice. It's not gonna be fun. You're gonna suffer with the mosquitoes in the field and you're gonna be afraid of the fleas and the ticks and everything else. So you just choose wisely. And if you, if you choose what you wanna do, you're gonna enjoy it. All right, thank you. Yeah, with those gorgeous birds you had on some of those early slides, good <laughs> grief. Hard not to enjoy that, at least from my perspective. Uh, another question um, from Chad and Jimena, I'm not sure which one uh, offered this question, but it says, um, does the economic production of high quality coffee from high biodiversity shade farms outweigh the economic output from high producing sun farms? That's a great question. Really good question. That's one of the big challenges that we had, Chad and Jimena. I think that, um, when I was thinking, when I was talking about uh, how to, I mean, so so in the place that I that I work um, right now, which is the in English would be the the Tropical Agricultural Research and Higher Education Education Center, which is located in Costa Rica. We do a lot of work with small and medium farmers, and we do a lot of promotion of agroforestry systems. So that's basically in the core of what Katia does, which is the acronym from that really long name, and. What we found is that, for instance, um, a lot of the times people are going to say, okay, but I do get good productivity with some coffee. So why should I care about having trees and birds and bees if what I care is about the product that I'm, or the, the, the amount of productivity that, that I'm getting and how much money I'm making out of this. Um, but I think that more and more when we think about ecological resilience and ecosystems and actually thinking about now the, the whole condition that we're immersed right now that makes you think about the what's the condition of our ecosystems and how we're affecting everything and it's coming back to us. It's coming back to the human health. So it's a very interesting discussions out there right now that go beyond the economic value of, of having um, how much money I'm making this year um, in terms of how that's going to play out in the next 20 years. And most of the time, the big issue is that a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of big companies or, 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 or some farmers actually also, small and medium, they got to think about today. They got to eat today. Um, they got to think about how they're going to sustain their families. So they don't have time to think 20, 20, 10, 20 years from now. So I think it's still a big challenge. I don't have the exact answer to it. If I had, I'll be really happy if I get to that in the next maybe 20, 30 years. But that's one of the big things that we're all trying to um, come up creative ways to justify why one thing um, weights more than the other. And I think the, the critical thing here might be uh, what are those interactions and those multiple relationships that we create in these systems and how they come back to or benefit. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, a question from Dan. Uh, I guess first a comment, this coffee borer, coffee bird bee system is so amazing. I have a speculative question. Are there other less studied Mesoamerican agricultural food crops or food ways that you think similarly might involve ecosystem services from birds? Absolutely. Yeah, and one of the things that um, I'll be happy to do in the, in the near future is to explore other, other crops because um, there's many other, I mean, coffee is really important in, across all Central America, in some countries more than others, right? So, and, and not just Central, but also Mesoamerica if we include Mexico. So when you move from Mexico to Central America, and, and don't get me started with South America, so Colombian coffee, you probably heard about it, or Brazilian coffee, but that's a completely different reality because those countries are huge. So when we're thinking about it, it's like, okay, in our small scale, like in our Central American countries, what else can, can we work on? And there's a couple of very interesting 
um, crops that are for export that I'm sure that, that the birds or other, ins or other um, organisms are also uh, uh, contributing to the not, not just pest control but also pollination. There are actually a couple nice studies from California that I'm reading uh, in strawberry fields and actually in, 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 in other types of crops that are also giving me ideas of what else can we do. And they're also not just birds um, and in pest control, there's also bats. There's really nice studies of bats in cacao systems in Indonesia and, and in other places of the world. And when we think about pest control, not only birds provide the service, we can think about, um, there's the, the lab, a lab from very famous in, in the US that, that looks at all these networks and interactions uh, with ants, um, spiders and birds and bats and what, what's up not, which, how all of them are contributing. So we, a, a lot of this is um, that we just need to keep exploring these questions and see if the patterns repeat in other crops or if there's more strong or stronger in certain crops than others and how we can come about um, uh, helping manage these lands in a, in a more biodiversity friendly way. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, lots of other thank yous in the chat. Um, and then maybe uh, another question here, maybe one more. Um, from Chad and Jimena again said, awesome, thank you for speaking on the views of workers who were living with the reality of living day to day. Um, oh, and then the question was, um, uh, where was it? Uh, yeah, how can we follow your work? Email, social media? Sure, uh, I mean, you can do, uh, um, Sorry, I forgot my English. <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I actually put it on the presentation, so I don't know if you got that, but I can also also share the, the presentation with Matt if, if you want. And um, you can, of, of course, follow me. I'm usually, I try to be more sitcom proactive, um, science communication, I'm working on that. Uh, and also Matt has my email. If you have specific questions, you just, make sure to shoot me an email and I'll be happy to help in, um, if, if I can, you know. What's your, what's your email again, Alejandra? I'm, I'm Martinez. I'm actually going to write it down on the go. chat so everybody Perfect. can have it. It's amartinez at katye at az at Perfect. All right. Thank you. And my, and what else? This, uh, this is my, Twitter handler. So welcome everyone. <laughs> Happy to share. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I have so a question. One question. Actually sure. two. Yeah. Thank you so much for that wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Frank Juma and I'm a MAD grad student from Africa, Kenya, where we're working on mm. coffee. Your findings are relatively similar to what uh, we got from our preliminary results. But I was a bit curious about now that you've worked on coffee for a very long time. Uh, how do migrants, you talked about neotropical migrants, how do they utilize the coffee habitat, uh, both sunny and shade coffee, in the sense that uh, I'm trying to relate this to Africa, whereby we have Afrotropical migrants that mm -hmm. when they come up, because these are birds that are more south, so anytime they come up to the equator or relatively past the equator, our resident birds tend to freak, they tend to shy, so they don't really utilize the habitat and in most cases they tend to hide. I don't know if uh, at all you are a little bit keen and see this kind of pattern uh, when you are working on coffee. And my second question is that uh, in one of the biggest uh, coffee farms that we've been working recently, uh, they have come up with a variety, two varieties of coffee that they are trying to see. One of them was as a result of grafting and another one was a, as a result of uh, cross-pollination. In your experience, uh, do birds, have they in any way uh, improved the variety of coffee? Those are my two questions, thank you. Okay, so thank you so much, Frank. Um, beautiful country you have. I had the opportunity to visit once a couple of years ago and I would love to go back 
a um, lot of envy, but it's so much diversity of things to see and, and do. Um, so the first question, and, and correct me if, if I don't understand correctly, you wanted to know if, if I've noticed any patterns in terms of how the, the different, the residents and the neotropical migrants use such these lands, whether there's some competition or, or something going on when ones get and the other ones um, sparse or something like that. I gotta say that I haven't noticed that, but I haven't actually studied it either. Um, what I did found out in one of our studies, which was the first one that I presented, is that it actually seems to be a complementarity between the residents when they're there, the insectivores, and where the neotropical migrants land. And, and that, um, that means that they're both in the same places many times. So many times that I go into, into the farms that, I, that, that we're sampling, um, I don't see uh, like a, a less proportion of residents, but again, I haven't actually tested it. But just by, 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 by looking and getting the perspective of my years in the field, like you said, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that, that the residents kind of like go away when the migrants get. It actually feels like a big party. Like, yo, my friends just came to visit, so let's go out. Um, so there's a nice, I think, interaction. So that, but that would be interesting to, to test. And what you're saying, it's, it's actually interesting. And the second question is about the coffee varieties and if I've seen uh, there's a difference between the capacity of bees to pollinate depending on the variety. Uh, am I correct? Okay. So, okay. So the coffee variety world, it's another world, right? And I'm not an expert in coffee varieties. I have to come clean about that. Um, what, what I can say from our experiments in bee pollination and what we're seeing in the field is that, uh, okay, so there's a lot of also, um, I would say that, um, um, okay, six, I'm forgetting my English now, there's a lot of controversy. That's a word that I was looking for. There's a lot of controversy when it comes to pollination on coffee, because some coffee plants can auto-pollinate. So a lot of agronomists actually argue that, okay, so we don't really need the bees because the plant, coffee plants can actually auto pollinate. So what are you talking about bee pollination and contribution of bee pollination and conservation of bees, which is a major issue when we are trying to push forward an agenda of working together and doing biodiversity conservation in ag lands. But the thing is that there's, um, uh, there's many different experiments that have, have actually demonstrated the, the added value of having the bee communities present in these plots. That doesn't mean that the planet's not going to be able to produce fruits, but having bees improves the probability of having more fruits. So it improves your capacity of increasing productivity. I'm not, particular I'm not particularly familiar into differences of um, pollination success rate between varieties. So uh, I, I cannot really say anything about that. I'm just, I, I just can't say that it's, it's, a, it's a whole field in ecology where in term, when, when it comes to coffee, there's controversy, especially dealing with Arabica the Arabica variety, because it's out of pollen, uh, it has capacity to out of pollinate. But what many different studies have found is that actually having the added uh, contribution of bees and actually probably cross pollination actually helps the plant produce more berries and more berries is more seeds and more seeds is more money. So it's actually something desirable. Great, thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, more thank yous in the chat. Thanks, Jimena. <laughs> it's too bad we're not all here in person. It'll happen soon, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you owe me a visit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, thanks, Kevin. Muchas gracias, Kevin. Yeah, next time we can do it in Spanish. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, so I believe we have one more speaker in the Next Gen Eco Series. That's right, Dan and Frank. Do you guys have that um, date handy? Just we can announce that quickly before folks leave. Does anybody know that? 
If not, keep your eyes peeled on the email. You'll get lots of announcements. Um, it is December 3rd, I believe. I'm double checking that right now to make sure I'm not misspeaking. All right, thanks. Yes, Thursday, December 3rd. So this one will be the, our one Thursday one. Okay. All right. Thanks for that reminder. All right. Well, um, again, on behalf of all of us, Alejandra, thank you so much. Um, it was really insightful and it was lovely to hear the work that you're, you have been doing and the new stuff that you're doing right now. It's always exciting to hear about what's, what's going to be next around the corner. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me and good luck. And yeah, we'll be in contact. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you. See you. Happy weekend. All right.